having outstanding nursing. It includes us practicing at the highest level of medicine that we can, but it also includes patient safety and patient quality. And we've had in this department a very robust uh, patient safety and quality assurance program for almost 20 years. Well, we've always had it, but we've particularly had it for the last 20 years with the really strong support of Susan Anderson and Karen Eppenclay and uh, Rick Bootman. I asked uh, Rick this year to talk about uh, the program that we've had on patient disclosure uh, because this year our theme, as you know, is on leadership and we're going to have kind of a re re uh, recurring uh, touch point around leadership uh, as we have different Grand Round speakers coming throughout the year. And Michigan and this uh, quality assurance risk management team have been real leaders in the area of patient disclosure. Uh, for many years, uh, hospitals and doctors have hidden their mistakes. And after the important Institute of Medicine report that crossing the quality chasm, I think there's been a focus on how we can improve patient safety. And as part of that, uh, there's been a, a, uh, a, an effort to try to be more transparent. And here at Michigan, that uh, developed into a program that was described as a disclosure program. Uh, it's something that Rick Luthman has led at this institution for a number of years. He's uh, published extensively about it. And it has been taken up at the highest levels uh, during the last presidential campaign. It was taken up by, uh, by Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, who wrote an editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine, citing the Michigan Disclosure Program as an example of the kinds of things that might help healthcare reform uh, and uh, improve patient uh, care and patient quality. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Boothman. Uh, Rick Boothman is a lawyer who is the chief risk officer of the University of Michigan. He works very closely with uh, this department and all the clinical departments in assuring not so much that we minimize risk, which is certainly part of what we do, but most importantly that we provide the kind of care uh, that we can all be proud of. And as part of that, I think uh, disclosure and disclosing to patients uh, issues and problems is, uh, has been a priority. So Mr. Boothman, thank you very much for coming and thank you for bringing your team. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Um, I imagine when the email went out, uh, there was a collective groan because you're probably tired of hearing about this. It's only been 10 years, and almost every year we talk about it. Um, so instead of uh, talking so much about the past, um, okay, it's not obvious to me. Um, instead of talking so much about the past, I want to show you what 10 years of accumulated stuff has yielded by doing things a little bit differently. Um, what, what we've seen and what hurts a little bit and what is pretty interesting. Um, I have no, I wish I could tell you I had some great consulting gig that was dependent on this, but I don't. Um, so I want to talk about the next frontier. Uh, in some respects, though, I will tell you just a heads up, it's sort of a state of the union, the union meaning the whole health system I want to talk about. A little bit I'm, talk, I'm preaching to the choir because honestly, when I sat today and looked at the uh, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology's uh, trajectory, it's been nothing short of remarkable. And all of this talk around this place from dermatology, frankly, about service excellence, I think you ought to be out on the, on the stump talking about true uh, malpractice avoidance and true quality of care because the things that I think we've identified, you're already doing. So I, I, uh, I just give you a heads up. Don't be offended by some of the things I say because you are so out in front of most departments in this institution, it's, um, it's sad sometimes. So just a little revision. Uh, in 2001, we put, we kind of consolidated our thoughts in these three principles. And all of our claims, all of our health system response to patient injury really are funneled through these three things. Now, I didn't bring ethics to the university, but I think that we probably put things in a programmatic way, stabilized them, and made them a little more consistent so that you can predict pretty much how we, we as an institution are going to respond. So the first two bookends are very important. We will compensate our patients quickly and fairly when inappropriate care causes injury. Duh, does anybody disagree with that? 
No one in the country has disagreed with that. And yet that's not the practice. The practice all over the country is to defend and deny cases, and frankly, we did that. We did, in the old days, turfed almost every case to lawyers, and we would litigate for a while. We'd do it with ethics, we'd do it uh, in the right way, but we were consigning almost every patient injury to the courthouse. So the first ethic is, let's step up when we've hurt somebody through inappropriate medical care and do our best to make it right. But importantly, the second is just, just as significant. Everything you do is risky. You cannot give a kid an antibiotic injection uh, for his first ear infection without risking death in a certain percentage of those kids. And you can't control all of the risks. So the key for us is knowing the difference between avoidable and unavoidable uh, health risks. What was reasonable under the circumstances is extremely important for us. Those two, if you look at them, what do they tell you behind the scenes? What's the subtext? The subtext is we don't need no stinking courtroom to tell us when we screwed up. There's a sense of control over our approach that, that lets doctors feel that this is really our call first and foremost. It's really our judgment whether we made a mistake or not. And you have a couple of doctors on our medical liability review committee, and I'll show you where that fits in, in the scheme of things, who work extraordinarily hard, Dr. Vandeven, Dr. Reynolds, work extremely hard on every case that involves obstetrics to help us sort out what's right and what isn't. The time they spend is invaluable. The third, is probably the most important and the oddest for me. As a trial lawyer that represented hospitals in Michigan and Ohio for 22 years, uh, including the Cleveland Clinic and Henry Ford and this place, not a single client ever asked me what they should have learned from the cases I handled. So in 2001, when I left private practice, I was determined at a minimum that we would learn from these experiences and we would hardwire that in. That's what's different about this. This is not just a claims management strategy. It is an integral strategy to improve patient care, to make all of you safer, to make all of you happier and avoid the courtroom. It's not just apology saves money. And when Dr. Johnson talks about the word disclosure, and I don't like that word, but it, it is tagged to us all the time. When he talks about disclosure, the really the first disclosure is to us. It's our recognition that we might have done or could have done or should have done better. And that's the disclosure that happens before we even think about talking to the patient. So this is just the claims management flow, uh, and, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just so you know, the patients are always engaged, whether, whether an injury comes to us because somebody called us and said, the body's still warm and it's down here in PACU and, and we're in trouble, or a lawyer comes to us with a claim. No matter how we receive notice of an injury, we engage the patient and family. Actually, Susan and, and uh, risk management do all the hard work. I don't have to do that. But we engage the patient and family in a constant and, cr and continuing discussion. There's an investigation to know what we're dealing with. Because no matter how clear it seems when it comes in the door, there's always little twists and turns. We don't ever want anybody to just abjectly apologize in the heat of the moment until we understand what's going on. So it takes us sometimes hours, sometimes days, sometimes months to figure it out. But it goes through this committee, the Medical Liability Review Committee, that's the committee Dr. Reynolds and Dr. Vandevin sit on, goes through that committee, we have a robust discussion, we emerge with essentially a finding, did we violate the standard of care or not, and did we make a difference in the outcome or not, and the patient has continued to be engaged, no matter if it's a $10,000 case or a $10 million case. We have an open discussion with everybody who's willing to talk to us. They don't always like what we have to say, and more often than not, we're telling people that there has not been a mistake. We're telling people, here's exactly what happened, let me dispel these crazy ideas sometimes patients have before it gets too far. 
Coming out of that, every patient is engaged based on the conclusions that we've reached. Uh, and for the most part, we act consistently with our conclusions. I say for the most part because there are some cases which just don't, aren't going to play very well. The case that haunts me to this day is a case of twins who were born at St. Joe's, very premature. Twin B, they were both sent over here. Twin B got a clot in his aorta, and when they tried to break it up with TPA, they caused a huge cerebral bleed. That child was a wreck, and there was a perfect copy next to it. We paid $2 million on that case, and I don't think we did anything wrong. There is a small minority of cases where we don't think we did anything wrong in, and we still try to settle because the system that backstops us, the litigation system, is so imperfect. There are sometimes I just can't in good conscience expose you and the institution to that risk. More about that in a minute. We hardwired clinical improvement, peer review, and educational opportunities to that committee. That is considered, to this day, a revolutionary idea. Lawyers all over the country still tell doctors, don't talk about it. And the reason they do that isn't because they're terrible people. It's because they're focused on maximizing their chances in court, and they don't want to complicate things with a stray disclosure here and there. Well, we said the idea, the whole notion of favoring that case in court and that outcome versus all the patients who may come through the system before that case has been litigated is nonsense. It's ridiculous to say, let's worry about that case at the expense of risking all the future patients. So we want that discussion to happen as quickly as possible. We want all of these things to happen and we'll deal with it in court. So what's happened in the last 10 years? Well, we're closing claims faster. And I want to remind you, tort reform happened in 1994 in this state. So this is not the impact of uh, any change in legislation. There are no new laws in any of this interim period. What you're seeing, I think, is the result of uh, doing this proactively and on a principled basis. We're increasingly avoiding litigation. These are two slides. That top slide um, reflects the uh, uh, all of the claims that have been resolved and dropped. So this is just a reflection of our claims activity uh, on the top and the bottom are, is a reflection of how many times we've had to resort to litigation to resolve those. So you can see that the litigation's dropped off considerably. And this is another one just showing the claims that we've, uh, the true claims that we've had um, that we've had to resolve or dealt with on our level versus in a courtroom. Um, claims numbers have steadily dropped. We are, when I, when I started in 2001, we had roughly 300 claims at any given time. Today, 80 to 90. It's pretty remarkable. Our clinical activity has gone up. I think Vanita Ball told me 37% in the last 10 years, and yet our claims have dropped down. And you can see those are the way the claims are coming down. But we've reached a plateau which bothers me. Theoretically, if we've made all these hardwire connections into patient safety, we should see claims continue to drop. We should think of ourselves as safer, but I don't think we are. And we've stopped at 80 to 90 and just hit this plateau. And what's worse, the reserves, the money we set aside to deal with the claims in the litigation have started to trend upwards over the same number of claims. So this line shows you the amount of money we set aside to deal with your claims. This last spike is very disturbing because over 80 to 90 claims still, we're now reserving $10 million more than we did over the same number of claims last year. Why is that? It's not because the courthouse has gotten crazier. It's because we've had some really serious um, and indefensible losses on catastrophic cases. I'm happy to say it's not been uh, in uh, OBGYN. The worst is the higher percentage of cases that by our own assessment are meritorious. And this next graph I think is very important for you to pay attention to. This shows each column, each dual column, is the amount of money we spent in every clinical or every fiscal year, starting with 1999. So you can see what happened here before 2001. Almost half the money we were spending um, was in cases. The red bar are cases that, by our assessment, we did not we did not violate the standard of care, and yet we were still paying on those cases. 
So over here, all those cases we disagreed with, we thought we didn't do anything wrong, and yet we paid nearly $12 million in 1999 on cases. And it led us to believe that the system's broken, uh, woe is us, doctors are being taken advantage of, we can all do the best thing possible and still get sued, and that was true. What was worse, though, is we agreed with it and we paid on those cases. So in 2001, when we said, no, we've got to take a, uh, a really principled look, look what's happened to that red column. It's come down quite a bit. It's up here a little bit. Uh, we, had a, we had a major case in 2009, but for the most part, this is pretty satisfying. What's disturbing is this line, because we don't have any excuses anymore. By our own assessment, the losses in green are things that we agree we breached the standard of care. That's both disturbing and helpful. So it's helpful because we have a clarity few health systems have. If you approach any hospital in this country today, even today, and you ask them, when you get sued for malpractice, is there any significance? Does it tell you anything about the quality of your care? They will say no. We get sued when we do the right things. We get sued when we do the wrong things. Malpractice is just broken. It's a terrible system. We can't say that anymore. We've weeded out most of the bogus claims. We've largely avoided litigation and kept tried, done our best to keep you out of court so that's not hanging over your head. But we can't blame, uh, for very much anyway, greedy lawyers or opportunistic patients anymore. Uh, this is on us and we have to own it. We continue to cause those injuries. So the two things that I want to talk about um, in the health system in general are these two. <clears throat> we can't take it all on. There's myriad uh, things that contribute to this. But if we act only on the problems we know about, we will eliminate a lot of this. And what's sad is when you look at the cases that are pending right now that contribute to the, to the large reserves that we have, I would estimate a good 70% of those in 70% of those, when we've done the investigation, we hear things like, oh, just a matter of time before that happened. We knew that was a weak, she was a weak resident. We had a, a resident in one of the surgical services left here with five claims, five claims. And the chair of that service is angry with me because she can't get licensed in a, in a, a state in the West. That reflects a failure to own this problem. So if we deal with these two things, I think we'll make a big difference. Here's what I, uh, so we talk about being honest and proactive, and I mentioned that the first disclosure is the disclosure that we have to make to ourselves. When we make excuses or when we overlook or decide not to call out a problem or a practice or a problem person, we are essentially putting our comfort level out in front of patient safety and frankly out in front of improvement of your colleague. So when you see something that, that you think is pretty bad and you decide not to pick up the phone and call, essentially the equation you're working in your mind is, mm, I don't think I want to get involved. I don't need to uh, have my name associated with this. I'll look the other way. Good example. We have a surgeon who did an operation that was grossly outside his staff privileges. He did an operation that normally takes four hours. He did it in 12. He had to have the patient then uh, moved by ambulance for, uh, to the PACU uh, because uh, of terrible swelling and airway problems. As best as I can tell, at least 12 people were involved in that case. It was a terrible outcome. This lady has got a, it was a, a head and neck surgery case. This lady has got a terrible stricture around her neck. And I didn't find out about it until the surgeon, oblivious to everything else, all of the issues that exist in this case, called me up and said to me, this lady's gonna need five more surgeries and I want you to cut a check. I want you to pay for it. It's the only way it came up. There were at least a dozen people who knew about this and never said a word. That's what I'm talking about when I say we are aware of problem people and problem cases and for various personal reasons we don't speak up. We need to be more proactive. So I had this conversation with a surgeon not too long ago. 
Within six months of joining a faculty here, I had a short list of people I knew I never wanted to be in an operating room with. And most of them are still here, and I still don't want to be in an operating room with them. You know the sad outcome of this conversation? I slid a legal pad across the table and I said, give me your top five. He would not put a name on the list. He would not put a name on the list. Why? I can't understand that. When people's lives are at stake, when colleagues are at stake, when nurses are placed in awful positions by surgeons who are doing things they shouldn't be doing, and yet that surgeon was free to talk about the problems, but not the people. Well, we need to understand that, I think, better. We don't have the luxury of turning away. And here's the funny part, here's the irony. If you really think you're doing somebody a favor by not speaking out, here's what actually happens. We get into a situation where colleagues are challenged and we turn the other way and those challenges never go away. They only get worse. And the history here has been to wait until somebody bottoms out, to wait until somebody has become such an embarrassment that now we can't turn away. So several years ago, we had a, uh, an endocrine surgeon who was long past his prime, killed three people before it came to our attention. The last person was an elective adrenalectomy that he did laparoscopically, and he wasn't trained for it laparoscopically. And when I did the investigation on that case, you know what I found? I found clerks who said, oh, every time his name shows up, we actually bring blood to the OR. Why do you do that, I asked, and they said, oh, for throughput. It wasn't fa patient safety, it was just to avoid the delays because he was getting so bloody, even the clerks knew that we should just have blood down there. His colleagues thought that he was uh, basically incompetent for several years. Anesthesia had even changed their staffing patterns to deal with him so that they could always have somebody experienced in a room with him, and yet nobody thought that it was their duty to speak up. How do we create a culture where even that clerk says to herself, when I find myself thinking that I've got to prophylactically order blood because he's just getting so bloody that it's become a habit, I should call someone. We don't have that yet. And the longer we wait, the worse it gets. And then, once it gets really bad, it becomes punitive and disciplinary, and people suddenly disappear from your ranks. In that sense, that it's always going to be punitive, is a reason why, one of the reasons why people don't pick up the phone. I don't want to be responsible for him being thrown out. But you see how counterproductive and awkward that is? If we had gotten on top of it in, fr in the front end, when someone was first evidencing some struggles, we could get, on, get our arms around them and make them better, not just make them disposable. I feel very passionate about this, and I think that this, if we could fix this, if we could change this, it would make a difference. Now, I know that I'm talking to the choir a little bit because your program, your peer review program, has set the pace, frankly, for the institution and for the country. And a lot of credit goes to Dr. Perlman and Dr. Johnson and, and Dr. Vandevin and everybody who plays a role in having residents fill out your cards and all of that, that's been fantastic. But you are so far ahead of most other departments here, it's sad. In terms of the way we do our event reviews, I think we're too reactive. If you look at our Sentinel event practice, did you, I, I didn't know this until relatively recently, by design, our Sentinel review practice avoided any individual peer, uh, performance issues. If it looked like the problem resulted from a doctor who may be a little challenged or, or a resident or even a nurse, they completely avoided it by design, on purpose, because they didn't want to get into peer review issues. They were stuck on this notion that we need to be a blameless culture. Sorry, it didn't work. So we're re revising this. We need to think differently. We need to ask different questions. And we need to tap pockets of information that we know exist here that tell us things about patient safety. So why not ask residents all the time, what do you think about the attendings? Does one heart surgeon really know about the quality of the guy in the office next to him? Probably not. When they operate together, they're both on their best behavior. They're not going to throw instruments if a colleague is in the room, but they will when residents are there. They're not going to rush through a surgery or show up late after the chest has been open for 20 minutes. 
if they know one of, one of their colleagues is there. The best sources of information on, in some clinical settings is not your colleague, but it may be the anesthesiologist who's in there day in and day out. It may be the nurse practitioner who's working side by side with somebody in the clinic. Why are we so afraid to affirmatively go out and ask those people, what do you think about the quality of the folks you're working with? Every day we talk to nurses who say things like, oh, we know exactly who to go to and who not to go to. I wouldn't want my mother being treated by her. Well, if we feel that way, don't, why, don't, why is it that we don't feel a responsibility to step up and say, mm, maybe there's some reason for this. It's not just a personality problem. So I think we've got to think differently uh, for the new frontier if we're going to make a difference in that green column uh, reflecting all the people that we're hurting. So various things. I also hate our addiction to others' report cards. Um, this notion that we don't measure anything until somebody tells us to measure. I watched a presentation from Tom Peterson the other day. Uh, he delivered it with a sense of urgency on how noisy our hospital is. Well, we've had the same hospital for 30 years, and it's a little anachronistic. We've got semi-private beds, and it's not a new concept that being quiet and having a, having a nice, tranquil environment will, will feed into the healing process. That's not a new statement, but all of a sudden it's a priority. Why? Because the government's measuring now complaints about noisy hospitals. Why is it that we wait until the Joint Commission gives us a list of things, or CMS says, here's never events that should never happen? Why aren't we taking control of that and saying, let's have our own report card? What is important to us, not what's important to the Joint Commission or CMS or, or HCAPS or what other, what other kind of measure you want to do. It's a reflection of taking control and ownership over this and accountability for these things. And that's the next frontier, frankly. I, we, I propose that we videotape surgeries. Skip Campbell put that in his chief brief, and you can't believe, well, maybe you can, the responses he got. Oh my gosh, you'd have thought I was proposing that we all operate naked. <laughs> it was unbelievable the hysteria that came out over the thought that we would videotape operations. And what's really interesting is, frankly, I would pay to have a videotape to defend you in most cases. I've got a serious cardiac surgery case right now that if I had a videotape, there would be no case. And yet the, the presumption is we don't want to see ourselves on tape because it's going to somehow cause a problem or a witch hunt. The panic set in, it was, it was incredible. Well, I think we need to be open to those sorts of things. We know that our perceptions of ourselves are rarely accurate. When you, ask, when you ask operating teams, how did the operation go? Invariably, the surgeon's score is way higher than everybody else in the room, invariably. And that study's been repeated over and over again here and in Australia. In Australia, they videotaped surgeries for a period of time and then showed it back to the surgeons after interviewing them. So the surgeons would be asked, well, were you nice during that surgery? Were you polite and cordial and professional? And they would always say yes. And then they'd play the videotape back and the surgeon himself would be just stunned at his own behavior. We need to, we need to be open to these ideas if we're gonna improve to the next phase. Then we've got to act on the information we collect. As I said, we've got this addiction to avoidance, this notion that mm, this is a problem and I'll just make a mental note that my kid should never see that pediatrician, but I, don't, I guess I don't care if anybody else's kid sees them. We've got to get past that. So peer review, I think Skip Campbell was a genius when he had an elegant and simple idea for peer review. Peer review here, and he, he probably picked up a lot from Mark Perlman on, on this, but he said to us, I want peer review to be relevant, I want it to be proactive so it can be embracing and not always punitive. So how do you make it proactive? Well, <clears throat> at I mean, how do you make it relevant? At Harvard, they just took some random uh, uh, points and that's what they measure. For every department, one size fits all. And I watched a presentation from them and I thought, oh, you guys are light years behind us. 
Skip Campbell went to every department uh, chair and chief, every service chief, and said, I, I'm not going to tell you what's important. You're going to tell me. You tell me the 10 things that if you heard them happening in your service, you would have to say, maybe there's a safety problem. We will call those patient safety indicators and then we will get Vanita Ball in here and Vanita is going to link those things to our billing data and we can now produce radar graphs for those departments that are engaged in this. We can actually produce radar graphs at a, at a, at a flip of a button from surgeon to surgeon, clinician to clinician and measured by the same things and we can spot the outliers. So what good has that done? Well, we identified two emergency room doctors whose EKG uh, interpretations were consistently outside that margin. Thankfully, nobody got hurt. They were both re-educated, they were both um, uh, coached in all of that, and now they're squarely leading the pack, not, not uh, outliers. That's what proactive and relevant risk or peer review can do. So Skip said, let's make it relevant, let's make it evidence-based. Vanita can pull down dating data to, to uh, look at each one of those things. And now we're starting to see these points integrated into department quality efforts. And it's actually pretty cool. That stigma that's attached to peer review doesn't seem to exist once people realize that by being proactive, you can get out and help somebody before they hurt someone. Are there singular events which standing alone signify maybe we've got a, a, a more serious problem? Absolutely. Can I tell you that it is always embracing in a big kumbaya hug and, and not sometimes punitive? No, I can't say that because some of us do some pretty remarkably bad things. But for the most part, if you can get out in front of it and be honest about it, have it evidence-based, we can do it in an embracing way and in a way that salvages people, not makes them disposable. But we have to set our own expectations and we have to set them high, I think. We have to say to ourselves, not what is the lowest threshold, but what, what, what care would I expect for my mom or my wife or my daughter? So, as I said before, if there's a process or a caregiver, you say to yourself, I sure wouldn't want for my family, don't we need to pay attention? We can't ignore a problem or a problematic person. We've got to talk to somebody. There's an interesting story from Telluride that I always think of in this regard. They had a problem with bears that were coming out of the mountains and rummaging through garbage. So apart from creating locked garbage cans, they created this system that if you saw a bear that was rummaging around town, they would come out and paralyze it with a dart and they'd put a yellow tag in its ear and cart it up to the mountains. But if they saw a yellow tag bear in town, they would paralyze it and they would put a red tag in them and cart them back. If they found a red tagged bear in town, they shot him. When they put that in place, the first year they had all sorts of reports. The second year the reports dropped off and the third year there were no reports at all. And the, the sheriffs in Telluride thought they had this raging success. And of course what really happened is the townspeople said, I don't want to be responsible for a bear being shot. <laughs> so now they ignore the red tag bears. <laughs> the word in town is let's not tell anybody about the red tag bear. Well, the same dynamic applies in peer review. I had a phone call from a nurse practitioner, no, I'm sorry, a respiratory therapist between Christmas and New Year last year, and she called in tears. And the story she told was a story of how there was a, there was a, um, a pediatrician, a, a specialized pediatrician whose behavior for seven years had been problematic. And I asked her, well, why are you calling? Are you afraid of... Uh, 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 recriminations? Are you afraid of something bad happening? And she said, well, no, I don't want him to get fired. He's a good doctor. He's just a jerk. <laughs> and that had, that had bothered her for that long before she finally picked up the phone. When we finally got him into a program that, that was a leadership program and had helped coach him for several years, everything's changed. So I think that's the key to this, is to understand that these don't have to be uh, punitive and they don't have to be disciplinary. They don't have to lead to nasty scenes and put you at risk, but they do need to come to light. Otherwise, we won't know about them. So it's important, uh, as I said, to be proactive because when we're not, the irony is that by avoiding it, it gets worse. And that's the spiral that we see. 
So goal number two, does anybody have any questions about peer review, how you do it here, where it fits in? The one complaint I have with obstetrics is you see things not from your department that you're not reporting. So I have a family medicine situation right now, and when we looked into something that came to our attention serendipitously, and I knew that obstetrics had also been involved with this case, nobody had called for several months. And then when we talked to the folks in family medicine, somebody said confidentially, oh, you don't know the half of it. Well, now I've got four cases instead of one, and we're, and we're looking at some cases of serious harm. I think the responsibility to call or act on these things transcends your role in your department. I think that if you see other people, and I don't care who they are in this institution, you've got to at least pick, a, pick up a phone and trust that it's not going to get handled like a blunt instrument. We will handle it delicately. We will do our best to preserve your confidentiality, but we can't fix what we don't know about. So goal two, quality of our patient-physician relationships directly impacts safety and medical malpractice claims. The most obvious example of this came to light last week when somebody complained to me, and it was one of our own cardiologists who was a patient here, complained that he had orthopedic surgery and never saw his surgeon again. He was in the hospital for four days, never once was visited by his surgeon. He had a complication. It was explained by a resident, but he couldn't believe that the attending would not come and talk to him, indeed a colleague. He, he was flabbergasted. Unfortunately, that's more the rule than the exception here. And that's just the bluntest example of this kind of thing. I hate the concept of informed consent, not because there's something wrong with talking to people, there's something wrong with thinking that it's a special event. To, to not talk to people and patients about their ongoing and dynamic medical needs and condition, except when they're gonna have a procedure or a surgery, I think is wrong. I think that may have been fine years ago, but in today's age when people are on the internet and people are getting second opinions and everybody's an expert in your field, I think you need to keep them, you need to think differently about the way you talk to patients. Now, now again, I'm not talking so much to you guys because I understand, especially the obstetrics practice is very different here and always has been. But around our health system, this is an enormous problem. Enormous problem. My son had uh, surgery here the, uh, three weeks ago for a pilonidal cyst. He's 20 years old, he's a junior in Michigan, and he got home, doesn't know anything about healthcare. The first thing he said to me is, that's the noisiest hospital in the world. People are shouting and yakking away. And he said, and the worst part is, they don't seem to be talking to each other about anything substantive. Every single caregiver who came in didn't know what the preceding caregiver had done. Everyone who came in didn't know what the plan was going forward. And here's a 20-year-old kid who was smart enough to pick up on that without any egging on for me. If you think patients aren't noticing, you're wrong. And we need to change that in this health system. I want you to look at a couple of these quotes. We, whenever we settle a case, um, we ask patients or offer patients uh, the ability to be videotaped and share their stories. I have a couple of clips that I just, I want you to uh, watch. I think what, I, in retrospect, what I wish had been different is there really was not a lot of emphasis on what would happen if things did not go well and, and what are some of the risks of, and I, I think that they were quite minimized and I didn't, um, know enough to ask what the, those would be and I think in retrospect it was because I am um, was a, a healthy person so that I think people felt that they didn't need to tell me a lot as a lay person who's been around all of you for 30 years I have to tell you that it's a little bit like the experience if you've got kids, it's a little bit like the experience of picking your kids up from school and driving them home. You pick them up from school and you say, how did things go and you get one word answer, fine. Everything was fine. What'd you do in school? Nothing. 
But when they get in the back seat with their pals, they talk like crazy as though you have no ears anymore. Doctors are like that. You will talk to each other, but the concept sometimes of talking to the patient and sharing your fears, your concerns, what you're thinking, that concept is all too often alien here. And we hear that a lot. Uh, the, the complaint that the doctor didn't talk to me is by far one of the most common. Yeah, doctors do that. These are, sounds like a, kind of like a commercial for Hallmark or something, but these are real people with real families that when they come in that room and they have that mini console for five minutes, that that's our moment to ask questions and, and to listen. They, they're not listening. They have, they're just not. So again, the idea of just believing, can you, if it seems far-fetched, hear the patient, hear the family, value what they have to say, and then make, fit that into the context of their history. And then sometimes we use tool, uh, terms uh, the, the funniest one to lay people is pulmonary toilet. That's hilarious to most patients, and yet we toss these terms around like they don't mean much. But I've, had, I've heard doctors say to patients, your mother is trying to die. What a horrible phrase that is. It's not uncommon to hear those things. Those, though, I think we have to be more mindful of how we talk to people and what it means. I continue to complain about pain. My family... Um, continued to want to advocate for me because it was hard to see somebody like that. And I think we all kind of got labeled like, you know, this, this patient's a pain, her family's a pain. Um, and people would say things like, one of the doctors came in and said, you know, have you thought about doing some Zen meditation? Uh, I thought, well, no, because A, I don't know how to do that, and, and B, is that really your only intervention? That's all you got? I mean, I'm in a hospital here. If I were in a, you know, a Zen retreat, maybe we would work on those things. But um, that's not why I went there. Um, it was really difficult feeling like, you know, one of the doctors was clearly feeling that I was maybe drug seeking. And why do you want all this pain medication? What? Um, and I remember asking her that. I said, are you, are you suggesting maybe that, you know, I, I'm making this up to get more narcotics? And, and she said, well, Rick, we can't hear this. I'm sorry. He, so she's saying that when she asked for pain medication, she was, led, she was led to feel like she was a user or an abuser, that she was making this up because she wanted more pain medication. She said she got labeled. That it wasn't it wasn't uh, uh, a very um, uh, healthy way to have that relationship. Let me see if this last one plays better. If it doesn't, I'll just skip through. When I studied my position, my can you hear this? No. It's a kind of emerging area. I don't think it works that way. Oh. Little bit more. 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 Little surface echo uh, was stuff that some of the people at the University of Michigan had written scholarly articles on and the people who actually saw me did put the pieces and together they were in Michigan, uh, roughly the same time 2006 or so um, And I want people to know that that connection exists, that the, uh, so that the people who are practicing the medicine and not their patients can come up with the people who are doing the research, uh, what the test results may actually indicate about a person's condition. That's really what I'm doing this table. And vertical dissections are to be avoided at all costs. I recommend a way to lose weight or to address your bicuspid valve problem um, or any of the other things I've had to deal with. Uh, and if, it's, if it is avoidable, I believe it can be mitigated at least. Uh, it should be.
because it's, it's the things that happen. It's likely more likely to not kill someone. This man is one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. He's an environmental lawyer, um, as, uh, as thoughtful a guy as you could imagine. And he had been treating here for 15 years, and he liked the idea that he was being seen by residents. He thought it was so nice that he was contributing to the education of future doctors, and he was completely confident that the same attending was behind the scenes every time he came in and was correlating his care. Of course, that was the most remote thing from what was really happening. In fact, at that time, the attendings weren't even really watching very closely. He came in with a rapid heartbeat complaining of that, and he had a historical thing that was of significance. They just discovered that his daughter had a drug problem at age 17. So the question was, is it cardiac or panic attacks? And he was worked up properly. The echocardiogram didn't reveal anything of a rhythm disturbance, but it did reveal a dilated aorta and aortic valve. Nobody picked up on that because it didn't seem to be connected with the rhythm problem he was complaining about. So he was told repeatedly his study was within normal limits by the young resident seeing him. The attending didn't look at it, and for two years, his aorta grew and grew until it dissected when he was trying to lift weights and lose weight. That's why I don't lose weight, it's a difficult thing. <laughs> it's dangerous. He was trying to lose weight, he blew his aorta out, and we saved his life. He blew his aorta again, we saved his life a second time, but his life has dramatically changed. I don't know if we would have avoided that had we seen it. But this, when the surgeon talked to his wife, he said, did you know that his echocardiogram in 2006 was abnormal? And she said, no, we were told repeatedly that it was within normal limits, or the medical phrase, non-contributory. When he did the research, he said, oh my gosh, look at all these scholarly articles being published at the University of Michigan in aortic dissection and aortic dilation. And what we found was a remarkable and disturbing variation across all the primary care services as to how, uh, whether or not they would recognize that as a problem that needed attention and then what to do. Some said I would send somebody immediately to a cardiologist, some said I would send them to a surgeon, and others said, oh, if I reacted on every one of those, we'd have people going to cardiac surgery all the time. It was across the board. So when Dr. Johnson talks about our three-part mission, or in his email, a four-part mission, that it's research, education, and clinical care, and leadership is the fourth, he's, the patients are seeing that. The patients are seeing the disconnect between the researchers and the clinicians. We're not doing a very good job of pushing that out. We're still causing injuries we shouldn't cause. That case cost us a couple million dollars, but it cost him even more. And it shouldn't have happened. So those are the things I think our program is pointing us to. Susan's done a great job of molding risk management to be proactive and to be into things. Karen's done a good job of being present at your sessions. You need to talk to them. And you need to trust that it's not just whistleblowing and everything blows up. You need to share your concerns with your clinical leadership, with your quality leadership, so that we can talk about these things, because if we don't disclose to ourselves, we're never going to fix them. I want to ask Karen to come up and, and uh, just give you um, some information about your departmental stuff. Um, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. I just have a brief uh, couple slides here that show where the um, ob gen department is in relation to, to some of the graphs that Rick had shown you earlier. Um, in this graph here, what we have are the claims that we have received for each of the uh, fiscal years there. And as you can see in there, um, OB has always been higher. But what we are seeing within the department overall is that we're having a, a trend of decrease in the claims in OB, as well as a general trend down within the department. Now, if you look at fiscal years 10 and 11, that's still um, an unmatured area. It's ne we may still have potential for cases there because of the statute of limitation with kids. And as, what goes along with this is our um, number of births, the number of cases that we've had per 1,000 births per year. Um, looking at this, the trend is downward with our OB claims. And again, 
we have the um, high dollar cases. Over 10 years, we paid out over $25 million. Um, 21 million of that was in the OB area. And then as you look at the other areas, uh, we paid $2.2 million from Gin Ankh area. And then further down, gynecology is 616,000. And, um, and uh, repro endo is 38,000. And this is a busy slide, but what I want to point out here is these are the allegations that we have broken down between the 68 claims that we've had in the last 10 years for OB. And as you can see, our big areas are fetal distress, where we had 18% of our cases, and PLL management, which we had 15%. These are the areas that 10 years ago, Dr. Johnson, when he was talking about uh, kicking off some of the programs and working with risk management, these are the area that he has he mentioned. And these are the areas that we are looking at as we're with the QI department and with m and And then looking at the non-obstetric allegations, we have 39% of our cases are surgery related, um, hysterectomies and laparoscopic surgery. And these are um, complications related to it. And I do have to say in the last couple of years dealing with the um, gynecology cases that we have had, these cases have been closed. We have found that the standard of care was met, they were recognized complications, and we haven't paid any money out on those cases during this time. And then in this last slide, this is showing um, the total incurred for the claims per year. And again, your OB is the high area, and they are going down. But again, we're still not mature at the end there um, because of OB. And so, in closing, I just wanted to say that, you know, as Rick was saying, he talked about all these components, but I was talking to um, Dr. Nugent prior to this, and he talked about being a high reliable organization. And I think the department is on the road to being that high reliable organization, and they're taking steps towards um, improving. They're identifying additional areas that they can take work to uh, continue on this. Doing your team training, you're starting up the step training, you've got a simulation program going that is being built on, and you're looking to improve on communication. And then from the OB perspective, you've got that new hospital there, new ideas, moving into a new environment, being flexible to change, and we become more family, patient family oriented there as uh, we work with our patients and talk with them. And we've got the private rooms. We've listened to the patients. We're not going to have those complaints, uh, patient dissatisfaction with being up on seventh floor, having to share a bathroom as well as a room. And then that culture is safety, letting people be able to speak up, um, having that environment that people can talk to you and not feel like they're going to receive repercussions if they go up the chain of command or try to call somebody out on a safety issue. So um, if I can help in any way, I, I know I've been um, asked for cases for your team training as well as the simulation, but we do want to partner with you. And as Rick and Dr. Johnson have said, risk management is present at QI and m and and you have great programs there that I'm proud to be able to come to these and honored to be able to come to the meetings and sit in on these and to have people feel comfortable to give me a call. Any questions? Great. Thanks very much. shift in the paradigm. Maybe midway through the year, you and Susan and Karen can come back and we can talk about engaging the patients. You know, that's an, you know, I mean, that's an important part of what we do, so let's let's plan on that. Okay. Okay. I, mean, I would have liked to when you had some experience on how to do that engagement, mm -hmm. how call you and Karen and everybody in that process. That might be useful to people. This is really good. Thanks. Thanks, Al. That was uh, appreciated. That's what it was. What the hell's wrong with this?
Shit that's in here. This thing's being held up by a bunch of. Go look around back here. Hi, how are you? Good I'm to fine, see I'm you. Fine. I was just gonna come ask how Carl's your son's. Yeah. Yeah, how he's doing. He's doing well. So thanks. he's here at Michigan. Oh yeah, he's a junior in uh, economics, and um, um, you know it's a challenge with these kids, but uh, he's he's a good kid. What does he know? What he wants to do? I, I don't think so. He's he's talked about everything from being in the FBI and CIA to uh, going to grad school to. Going to law school, so yeah, yeah, and and uh, our middle daughter Erica just got into Ohio State Medical School, oh, okay. so she just had her white coat and all that. That's excellent. Um, and she's still working with uh, Frank on the Ghana project, uh -huh. so that's a lot of fun. That's awesome. So now, are you? Uh are you an empty nester? Close. Um, okay. Carl, we never know when Carl's going to show. <laughs> yeah, there's it. But, but other than that, we're going to be. And that's and I make no apologies, boy. That's pretty nice. Oh yeah. They, yeah especially no. as they get older, their the pace of their lives is so crazy, and and uh, I didn't realize how nice it was to have our house back until until they were gone. Yeah, it is amazing. It's different. So how are you doing? Good. I'm good. You know, so I'm transitioning from the midwife service group where we see patients in the clinic and you know are on call labor to the first to the triage coordinator role. Oh, I didn't so know I'll that. be just inpatient um, doing that oh, and good. you know we see all of the uh, physician patients who come in we're kind of the first evaluators uh, for that. So, yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's an important role. We've actually had a couple of um, cases that hinged on that. You know the ability to triage them smartly and, and document well because mm -hmm. the patient who are always problems are the ones who want to go home when you don't really want them to, but but it's sort of a gray area. Or the ones who call and they sort of minimize, it. in retrospect, it looks like they minimize things. So they'll call and say, you got a little pain, but it isn't so bad. I don't really want to come because it's February and it's right. 11 o'clock at night. And if you document that, yeah. well, you know, right. you can say. So, but anyway, yeah, it was a great, great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Right. We're so glad you're here. Oh. <laughs> You know, I blew the whistle twice and I got my ass chewed out. No. Why who? You want to hear the stories? Yeah.